So we're on chapter 16, and we're going to be talking about the post-Reformation period between 1517 and 1800. We're going to see the rise of modern science and new achievements in art and music. Reformation and science and culture. The years from 1500 to 1700 saw not one, but two profound upheaval evils in thought. What were these? Well, we know Luther, Calvin, Zwigli, and Knox were replacing a man-centered view of the world now with a God-centered view of the world. In science, Copernicus now, Galileo, Kepler, and Newton were replacing a universe that was centered on our earth with now the center uh, of the of the universe um, being placed on the sun. <laughs> and even further on that, the center of the universe um, be being replaced by infinite, inf infinite planets and infinite solar systems. The religious reformation and scientific revolution went hand in hand. So because of the reformation, we're going to have a scientific revolution. Can you believe that? The rise of modern science. Well, the return to the scriptures was important during this time. In the ancient books of philosophy, philosophy, which the church had venerated, were proven false. Those books that went back to Greek Aristotle um, really weren't really true. And the greatest of ancient books, the Bible, was rediscovered and found true. Without the Bible, men would have never discovered the foundational truth upon which science is based. Without the Bible, most people never understood the forces and laws of nature established by God. Many worshiped nature as God or fearfully held superstitions towards nature. The Roman church made things worse by officially approving the works of ancient philosophers, such as Aristotle. Thomism, which was uh, Thomas Aquinas, and scholasticism were the accepted um, ways to think, and everything else was forbidden and controlled. You had to think the way the church at that time, the Roman church, believed in what they accepted. Natural philosophers, let's talk about what natural philosophers are. What are they? Scientists began to search for the laws God had established for the good of man. And scientists at this time weren't called scientists yet. They were called natural philosophers until 1840. Philosopher means lover of truth. The early modern scientists were certainly lovers of truth. When free from persecution, Holland and England became Protestant, we know, and this made it free for them to work without the persecution of the Roman church. So most scientists at that time were Protestant, although there were a few Catholics who dared to question the official church dogma of scientific issues. People felt a responsibility to use their God-given talents to find ways to help others, and science became a tool to benefit mankind. So the problem was that they had dared to question um, the beliefs and the systems that were given to them by the church at that time, the Roman Catholic Church. And now they would flourish, believing in a true and living God and reading the Bible for key. Nicholas Copernicus, 1553, was a breakthrough for science with Copernicus, one of the first scientists of this era, of the post-Reformation. He was Polish, that means from Poland, and he was a Polish astronomer, astronomer propose, proposing a new way of understanding the universe. His book was The Revolutions of the Celestial Spheres. 
planets, including Earth, revolved around the sun. The Earth was not motionless, but continued to move. That's what he saw. And he called this the heliocentric view. Helio meaning sun. Helium means sun. Helio. So Copernicus, that first revolutionary um, scientist, of course, um, he was ostracized by the uh, church and persecuted by the church because he believed this, that the earth moved. Geocentric versus heliocentric. Aristotle, way back when, you know, um, BC, before Christ, held the geocentric, that earth is the center and the universe revolves around us. Geo means earth. So when you say geo, like geography, geo means earth. Copernicus, helio, helio meaning sun, um, so heliocentric would be the sun is centered and the earth revolves around the sun. Helio meaning sun. Here's Copernicus. From Copernicus, we go on to Johann Kepler in 1609. He was German. Now we want to go from Poland now to German. He was a German Lutheran astronomer. He dedicated his life to finding mathematical harmonies in the mind of the Creator. So Kepler went to math and he put math and science together. He retained Aristotle's idea that the orbits of the planets are circular. That is true. But he used the fact of his good scientific um, scientist buddy named Taco Brahe and collected, um, he collected all kinds of observations of the skies and gave it to Kepler. Kepler calculated the orbits of the planets in not perfect circles, he said, that they were ellipses. They were oval shape. Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. The first law was for that planets orbit the sun in oval shaped paths called ellipses. The second law explained why a planet moves faster when it's closer to the sun. The third law explains the relationship between the time it takes a planet to orbit the sun and its distance from the sun. Kepler mathematically, mathematically described the orbits. Um, that was foundational. He used math. This was monumental in science. When I say monumental in science, this, this was a now, as I said, a foundation that they would have to use mathematical principles to show what was happening or what was real or fact. And Kepler, of course, gave all the glory to God. Here's a picture of Kepler here. Was kind of, kind of uh, his story was he was born premature and he was physically weak and almost died. His family was poor. His father died um, in the 80 year war in the Netherlands um, way back um, when he was um, about, what, what um, uh, about three years old, I think it was, or maybe it was even before. And then his mother was a healer and a herbal herbalist and later on, she was even tried for witchcraft because of, of dealing with her herbs. Huh. So he had quite a life. Despite all that, there he studied. There he studied the planets. There he studied and mathematically um, proved that um, the, the Earth um, and, and the planets rotated in ellipses around the sun. A genius indeed. Kepler. He says, I give thanks, O Lord and Creator, that thou hast gladdened me by thy creation when I was enraptured by the work of thy hands. Behold, I have here completed a work of my calling with as much of intellectual strength as thou hast granted me. I have declared the praise of thy works to the men who will read the evidence of it so far as my finite opportunity could comprehend them in their infancy my in their infinity i should say my utmost is to reach the truth by philosophy but if anything unworthy of thee
thee has been taught by me, a worm born and nourished in sin, so thou teach me that I may correct it. So Kepler indeed had a heart towards his creator and towards God and was born of the Spirit. Galileo, Galilei. In 1597, you hear a lot about Galileo, right? Well, who was he? He was a great Italian philosopher and scientist that lived the same time as Kepler, but not in, not in Germany, but in Italy. The Catholic Italy was not receptive to any new scientific ideas. In fact, any scientist was persecuted if they didn't believe exactly as the, as the church directed them to believe. So here was Galileo in Italy. In 1597, Galileo wrote a letter which he stated that he believed that Copernicus, in his heliocentric view of the universe, was correct. Oh dear. Now he would be persecuted. He knew he needed a positive evidence to this because he was in opposition to the Roman church. So in 1610, what did he do? He built a telescope. The telescope had recently been invent invented by the Dutch, but Galileo perfected his telescope. And his eyes beheld the stars. He said they were so numerous as to be almost beyond belief. Indeed, he said, Aristotle had been wrong. Galileo was now convinced of Copernicus and his heliocentric view and all of Kepler's mathematical evidence. Galileo's look at the universe, the immensity and basic uniformity of the physical universe the single universe is unified by some basic components and laws, he said. He looked in the universe as a machine, stripping the material world of attributes which did not have a distinguishing, have and distinguishing the creator from his creation. I'll say that again. He looked on the universe as a machine, stripping the material world of attributes which it does not have the attributes in distinguishing the creator from his creation. So Galileo had a heart towards God. God's book of nature written in mathematical characters, that's what he said, was important. He said, a hundred passages of Holy Scripture teach us that the glory and greatness of Almighty God are marvelously displayed displayed in all his works and divinely read in the open book of heaven. That book cannot be read until we have learned the language. And he said the language of science is mathematics. I like what he said down here. In questions of science, the authority of a thousand is not worth the humble reasoning of a single individual. And indeed, Galileo stood against the flow of that time. Um, at that time, everyone believed Aristotle, but Galileo knew that Aristotle was wrong and he stood for it. Galileo's important truths. Heavy and light bodies of the same substance fall at the same speed. That was new. When they always thought, you know, of course, a feather is taken up by the wind but a heavy object falls the same speed as a light object. Huh, that is, that is very um, monumental, a monumental finding of Galileo. He said the law of uniform acceleration, the speed of a body falling in a vacuum regardless of weight accelerates uniformly with time. He also had laws of the pendulum explaining the relationship between the time it takes a freely swinging mass to travel in its arc. And he related this later to the pendulum clock. Galileo found principles by which man could build new and wonderful machines now. Of course, the Inquisition at that time in Italy and Spain forced Galileo to recant his ideas. 
but Galileo's concepts survived and later were expanded by great scientific geniuses that followed in his footsteps. Can you believe that? They made Galileo recant all of his scientific principles because they didn't follow exactly what the Pope and the, the religion, the religious at that time, believed. Crazy. And here Galileo, he read the Bible, and this is where he went from here and gave God the glory. Isaac Newton. Okay, Isaac Newton. Let's stop here, and we're going on 15 minutes, and I'll continue in our next video with Isaac Newton, the greatest scientist of that time, at least. <laughs>